Hello and welcome to an Ohio Learns 360 family webinar. I'm Amy Jurevich from WOSU Public Media. We're here today to discuss literacy for young learners. Learning to read is complex and it takes years to master the skill. Kids don't merely pick up reading by themselves. So what's the best way to teach literacy to young children? We will talk about the science of reading and hopefully provide some tips for families to use at home. Joining us for this discussion is Rebecca Pitcher, a literacy supervisor for the Montgomery County Educational Services Center in Dayton. Welcome, Rebecca. Nice to be here. Thank you. And also with us is Trisha Miranda, a literacy and English language arts specialist at the Ohio Department of Education. Welcome. Thank you. And you both have a lot of experience with teaching young children how to read, years of experience. So is there a single best method for teaching young children to read? Thank you, Amy. I think that's a really good question. It's on the hearts and minds of a lot of parents right now. And what we know that there are the most effective practices to helping kids learn how to read. So in schools, we think about um, what to teach, the content. So it's that sound awareness piece, that phonemic awareness piece, especially in kindergarten, and first grade, phonics, fluency, which is accuracy and that natural rate of reading, mm -hmm. vocabulary, um, and then comprehension. Those are all the five pillars that we really want to hit on in that early elementary piece. So that's what we teach. Then how we teach it, especially for those foundational skills in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, it's about explicit teaching. So assume nothing. <laughs> Make sure that it's rock solid, those foundational skills, and that we have a scope and sequence, a building of those skills in K1 and 2 for those phonics concepts, super important. Especially when they get to grades 4 and 5 and they're working in really complex readings, we want to make sure they can navigate those readings and they don't have any issues with multi-syllabic or words with multiple syllables. So we know that what to teach, how to teach, and then early intervention is really, really key. So students who have tender spots in certain areas, we want to make sure that we work on those um, so that they have that foundation for intermediate as well. Okay, and Trisha mentioned this idea of tender spots. Yeah. So can you expand upon that a little bit, Rebecca? What is, um, when you say a child has a tender spot, um, is that just, what, what do we need to focus on? It depends on the area. Mm -hmm. um, a student might have some some struggles with um, being able to hear rhyming in in words and sounds and being able to articulate different sounds and de decoding words or sounding out a word is how I learned it when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, using um, explicit instruction to help students really understand and identify those sounds in each word. Um, and then there's also areas of comprehension that we use different strategies to help those students um, as well. Yeah, so we were talking about, you know, she, you know, you mentioned a lot of things, vocabulary, phonics, I mean, there's a lot in there. So can you talk a little bit more about that phonics piece? Like, um, you know, Rebecca just mentioned, you know, it's sounding out words, right? But really we're learning, are we learning like, what the, what the letters can do, is that right? Yeah. So you're learning the sounds, there are 44 sounds in the English language, um, and then you're also learning the letters and the, applying the set sounds to letters, um, and then those, like you're learning those consonant, vowel, consonant words like cat or dog, um, and you're, you're applying those letter-sound relationships um, to that scope and sequence that we are learning. Okay, you wanna expand a little bit more on the you know, idea of decoding, as you called it, instead of like, so we learned it as sounding out the words, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. talk about what decoding means. So essentially, if I'm teaching a word like shut, for example, SH is a diagraph. So I wanna make sure that the students understand that it's not S, it's SH. Oh. So I'm teaching that phoneme or that, that, that correspondence between, when a, when a child sees SH, they know that they're going to say SH. And, and then I do a lot of multi-sensory with my students where we'll actually tap out our word. So if the word was shut, we'd say sh -ut, shut, like that. So they're actually able to be able to see it, say it, but then use a part of their body to help them remember those, those phonemes or those sounds. Okay, did, I mean, I don't know that I remember kindergarten, <laughs> right? 
Um, did we do that, you know, 20 years ago? Has, teach, has the way that we teach reading changed a lot? Is that, did, did we sound things out and do a tapping thing? Yeah, I, I think it depends where you went to school, but in some contexts, mm -hmm. we have so much research now that we really understand how important that sound piece is. Mm -hmm. For students who have language-based needs, it often is in that area. Mm -hmm. So that's why we want to hone in on that as much as possible. Um, and that explicit instruction piece, we have more research on that now as well, um, that those students, it's, it's, it's good for all students, but it's imperative for those students who have some real language-based needs as well. Okay, and I read, um, there's like a phrase that people use where they say that reading is taught, not caught, mm -hmm. is that? So, um, so even kids who have been read to every single day since they were born can struggle with reading when they get to kindergarten. Is that true? Y yes, that is that is true. Um, it definitely reach your children. We we want them hearing sounds and and building their oral language. Um, but yes, we do have some students that that have difficulty at those tender spots. Um, and so a way that we could work with them is uh, originally that your brain was not meant to read. There was a, a back part of the of your brain, your occipital lobe, that was just to a uh, baby's used to recognize faces. Um, and so what we're doing is we're training the brain and building neuro pathways to help students be able to um, identify the phoneme or the sound SH and know that it says sh and then put it together with the word shut and then know what the word shut means. And so we're explicitly teaching them those mm -hmm. skills. Um, so yes, read to your children, um, <laughs> sing to your children, label things in your classroom, immerse them in, in words, but we will need to do a little bit more, especially for those students who, who struggle a little bit more right. explicit. Yeah, Rebecca, I think too, because we all know that like oral language is natural. Mm -hmm. And so we think that reading is natural, but we know that with more research now, we know it really needs to be explicitly yes. taught. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. Obviously, that's the elephant in the room at this time. Um, are we still seeing, um, are we still in like reading recovery mode from the pandemic? I think it depends what school and what principal and the teachers you talk to. I think those schools that feel that they have those strong foundational skills in kindergarten, first grade, they're able to, and those students were able to secure their learning in those grades. They had a strong foundation, so they could just pick up kind of where they left off. Um, those students who missed that foundational piece and now they're in fourth grade, mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a gap. And so I know schools are really working hard. Teachers all over the state of Ohio are working hard to go back and remediate those gaps as much as possible. And I read somewhere that we're, a lot of people are trying to say, let's not focus on catching them up but more so meeting them where they are and moving forward. Would you agree with that? Well, I think you're looking at your grade level. So mm -hmm. if you're in kindergarten or first and second grade, that scope and sequence in phonics, you wanna make sure that you are meeting them exactly where they left off in their phonics scope and sequence and building on from that. So I think it depends on what particular subject or area you're talking about as well. Okay, so what's a way that we can help with this, you know, catching up or meet, meeting them where they are. Um, are we seeing a lot more, like teachers, classroom teachers spending more time on reading than they used to in the past? Or is it, does it need to be, um, you know, extra, extra tutoring or like, um, what's the best way? I think teachers are changing how they're teaching reading based on their, their students and their, the needs of their students. If, if we have some children that need a stronger foundation because they may have missed that, then they're gonna have a small group and do some interventions and some explicit instruction with those students to help kind of, it's, it's like Swiss cheese, there's some, some holes that need to be filled. Um, so it really just depends on the grade level and, and the students and the teachers um, to see where, where we can best fill in those gaps and build that foundation so that they, they don't have any areas that continue to, to grow in the wrong direction, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so what can parents do at home to help with the reading? Um, I mean, I, I, I as a parent, I don't know that I would be perfect at helping my kid learn to sound, sound things out and doing the phonics thing and the tapping. I'm not sure um, that, I, that I would know what I was doing. <laughs> well, I think 
that falls a lot on on us, the educators. I know we are trying to have family family nights where parents can come in, and I can talk to to families about some things that that they, they can do specifically for their children, and then watching their children. Um, participate in some activities where they're actually tapping out um, communication between the teacher and, and, and the parent, the families, letting them know some things that they can do at home and what we're doing in the classroom as far as this is exactly tapping or tell me what, you, what you've done today and they can read about what we are doing with their child and then practice doing those things. But communication is key. Yeah. So if, if parents, families, guardians have questions, let your let your teacher let your child's teacher know. Ask those questions because we know it's a team. We as a teacher we cannot do this alone. We need we need your help, um, and so that's really important. And that I feel like also that listening comprehension piece, especially in kindergarten and first grade, mm -hmm. along with the phonics, is super important. So hearing rich read aloud stories um, with lots of complexity and lots of vocabulary, either you know, a parent reading it or hearing it um, aloud audio-wise is super, super helpful for those students as well. Oh, that's a good idea too. So you can, obviously you want everyone reading to their mm -hmm. child, but that you can also have them listen to a story or like a, a story through a podcast or anything, right. something like that. Right. Is that what you mean? Yeah, there's so mm -hmm. many resources now online as well where authors are reading books to students. Mm -hmm. so, so that brings back that joy of reading as well. Right, and it, it could, doesn't even have to be just the audio. Could it be a, an author reading a book on a video too? Yes, Does that, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, I, I think that that would probably be fun and engaging for you know children nowadays who love to spend time yeah. on, their, on their screens, right? And our public libraries do such a nice job in Ohio as well as having so many resources for parents. Um, so those are, that's a great resource mm -hmm. as well as on readingrockets.org has mm -hmm. lots of family guides in different languages for parents about activities that they can do at home, similar to what Rebecca said about the sounds at home, as well as different play you can do with reading books. So re readingrockets.org, that, yes. is that, that's like a nonprofit kind of, it's a website that you can go and, can you find book lists on there? Um, they do have a hundred books uh, listed at, for, uh, just for enjoyment and reading levels, mm -hmm. that they, they do have that as well. Okay, so it's something that you could look at the book list and maybe find a few to get out of the library. Mm -hmm. But I mean, librarians are such a good resource they for are, that they too. Are, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, this is an Ohio Learns 360 webinar, and we are discussing literacy for young learners. We would like to thank Ohio Learns 360 and the Ohio Department of Education for their support of this initiative. The Ohio Learns 360 partnership is between Ohio's eight PBS stations with support from the Ohio Department of Education. At a statewide level, Ohio Learns 360 will be supporting families, educators, and students through community events, after-school programs, summer programs, and virtual programs like this one. OhioLearns360.org is a place where you can learn more. With us in the studio is Trisha Miranda, a literacy specialist with the Ohio Department of Education with more than 30 years of experience in education. And Rebecca Pitcher, a literacy supervisor in Dayton with 28 years of experience as a classroom teacher and a reading specialist. Now, families were able to submit questions in advance for our webinar guests, so I have a question from Caitlin. And Caitlin wants to know ways to improve a child's reading comprehension. She gives an example. She says, my first grader is excellent at sounding out words and reading in general. But if I ask him what he just read about, he has trouble telling me and he has to go back and read it a second time. So do you have any tips to help him comprehend what he's reading the first time around? Excellent question. <laughs> um, in school, a lot of times we do something called an interactive read aloud where I am reading to my students and I'm stopping and pausing and discussing vocabulary or asking questions regarding the characters. Um, per perhaps there's a problem or a solution or, or something that is going on in a conflict that the, the children can talk about in the middle of, the, of reading it and not waiting until the end of the story. Um, so it's really important that you, you interact with your child and ask questions as you are going along. Stop and pause. Sometimes I do a turn and talk where I'll ask a question and um, my students will turn and, and talk to each other. You can do that if you're reading aloud to your children. You have two, three, four, five kids at home and you're reading and you can just say, let's pause for a minute and let's talk about, let's reflect and think about what's happening here in the story. Um, and you can do that with nonfiction as well, not just 
fiction and fantasy. It, it works well with all across all genres. So mm -hmm. that is something that we do a lot, and I encourage my parents and families to, to don't just sit and read, and just make sure that we are all together in it. And to make it very interactive. Interactive stories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You want to add something about comprehension? No, I think those interactive and intentional read alouds are just super important. And I'm thinking about some of our new English learners, mm -hmm. and that's really how they build their vocabulary. Um, and so that's that's super important for them. So I know that the, the idea of um, some students, like what Caitlin was saying, was that her child is a good reader but has trouble with the comprehension piece. But then on the, on the flip side, there are some students who can comprehend a story. They can like tell the whole thing back to you if you read it to them, mm -hmm. but they have trouble with the actual words on the page and getting it. The, is, a, is that a brain to mouth connection too? Do you so they're, yeah, their listening comprehension might be excellent, but they are having trouble decoding the words. And so that's the specific area we want to work on with them. Um, or you might have a student who really comprehends well, but they're not a great speller in that writing and coding piece. And so I think years ago, we used to think that, oh, spell some people are spellers and some people aren't. But we've learned more now that there's more connection with reading and writing and spelling. Like spelling is super important. Mm -hmm. It kind of tells the tale of what that student needs are. So we also want to work on spelling with those students. So we have to all of those areas are super important. You might have a, a student you really thought or a child you really thought was doing well, well in first and second grade, and then you notice the spelling in, at, the, at the beginning of third grade, and that's something to work on. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I'm not great at spelling. I was never going to win a spelling bee, so maybe I need to go all the way back and think <laughs> about that back in kindergarten. Is that right? I think it's because a lot of times, you said it at the beginning, that English is complex, but it's not crazy. There is a logic to it. I think we think it's so complex that we can't learn the rules, but we can. Some people can know it. There's a few of us who can know it intuitively, but others, we really need to learn the rules of spelling, and so that's super important. I mean, I think sometimes I think English is crazy. I mean, there's certain words that like look exactly the same, but they don't rhyme, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, is that um, for someone who is learning English as a second language or a different language is spoken at home? Can you talk about that idea of just like learning the rules of, um, of, the, of the English language? Like, I mean, you start with them, you know, at a very young age and you just have to like pick them up or... Well, it's ex again, it's explicit instruction, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of words come from Latin bases or Greek bases, um, midi the, what is it, medieval English. So if if we're te if we know that background, we can teach specific rules based on that, um, like when to use TCH versus CH. I'm going to explicitly teach my students TCH is going to come at the end of a word after a short vowel. We're going to use CH at the beginning. Now, again, there are exceptions, um, <laughs> and we, we call those high-frequency words, and we have different ways of teaching high-frequency words. Um, but the is it 50% of English is pretty much you can decode it, and then uh, the rest of it, you can, there are words like the word, um, give me a word, with, no, that one works, what, mm. W-H-A-T. So most students would look at what, and they could, they know that W-H makes that sound, but A-T says at. So if we're teaching them to look at what, and we know that at least the, the first W-H makes that, and then we just have to memorize the A-T. Sometimes I'll, I'll have my kids put a little heart over top of the, the part they need to know by heart um, so that they can remember the, about the A-T. So being able to differentiate between the decoding the, the, and then the high frequency words. Yes. I, um Oh, go ahead. Did you want oh, and then when you get to fourth and fifth grade, whether you're a new English learner or, or someone who's been um, in the country the whole time, um, it, those, those words that have multiple syllables, it's, it's, break, it's easier to break them down when you've had that foundation in kindergarten and first grade that Rebecca was talking about. And we work on teaching the syllable types mm -hmm. so that students can identify and be able to break out the, break out the multisyllabic words, multisyllable words, um, so they know when it's an open vowel or a closed vowel, and we're, we're explicitly teaching, teaching that. It's remarkable what students can do when you unlock that code, mm. and they are able to read those giant words. I even have um, some gifted students in sixth grade. We are working on some phonics instruction that may have been missed out earlier. Um, 
in their foundation. And once they understand the six syllable types and the phonemes, they're able to decode those new words and they're not asking, you know, what is, the, what, what is this word, revolution? They know T-I-O-N, they know how to break up the syllables. Okay. And Amy, you had asked earlier about what's changed you know, 20 years ago. I would say colleges are looking differently about how they're training teachers. Yeah. Um, some of the items that Rebecca just talked about, you know, we didn't have classes in that. We yeah. kind of learned that on our own mm. and so forth. Um, but now there are more colleges that are teaching that because it's so specific um, and so needed in our schools. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about something that is known kind of in Ohio. It's called the third grade reading guarantee. So um, is, is it still so is it still true that, you know, for kindergarten through third grade, you learn to read and then from third grade on you um, read to learn? Is that is that still something that's true? And then a after you answer that, we'll get into the. Get, I mean, I guess you could say it's generally true, mm -hmm. but we are reading to learn um, as well in kindergarten through third grade because um, students are really getting lots of background knowledge. Mm -hmm. We're building uh, book texts or text sets, we call them, and multiple topics. So building background knowledge um, in those younger years is super important as well. Like sometimes we kind of have left that off, but we know that's super important too. I'm just wondering, is that why third grade was chosen as this year? So, um, so the idea was they wanted everyone to be able to read at grade level in third grade, right? Yeah, and I think it was based on some research that at third grade, um, things start to get more complex mm. in the different um, readings that you have in social studies, science, and, and other areas. So it's important to get um, by that age level and to get them proficient and at benchmark. Okay, so do you, what do you think, there, there, was an, uh, there was talk of trying to like change whether we had a third grade reading, reading guarantee or there was a bill that didn't go through of whether we should get rid of it. Um, do you think we need something like a third grade reading guarantee where it says that you're going to be at grade level um, at third grade? So really all the third grade reading guarantee, the roots of that is we're just taking a temperature check on students, right? We're monitoring, we're taking that screener or that diagnostic, where are they, right? Yeah. And those students that have some of those tender spots, then those teachers are doing some more intensive instruction in certain areas that are needed and, uh, and their progress monitoring where that child is um, so that they can get to benchmark by third grade and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the roots of it. And mm -hmm. so I think that part will always stay. And it does start in kindergarten. It's mm -hmm. not just third grade, here we are, let's take a test. Yeah. We wanna see where our students come in at kindergarten. And, and again, do a temperature check, kindergarten. Are they having areas that we need to work on? First grade, same thing, so that by the time they get to third grade, we're not trying to close gaps. We could, we've started and built, started with that foundation in kindergarten. So I think that's the purpose behind it, is to make sure that we're not just waiting to third grade to see, oh, can they read? Are they on grade level? <laughs> and uh, thank you again for joining us. This is an Ohio Learns 360 webinar, and we're talking about literacy for young learners. I'm Amy Jurevich. This webinar is a part of an initiative between Ohio's eight PBS stations with support from the Ohio Department of Education. At the statewide level, Ohio Learns 360 is supporting families, educators, and students through virtual programs, including series like this. Find out more at ohiolearns360.org. And again, we're talking with Rebecca Pitcher, a literacy supervisor for the Montgomery County Educational Services Center. And with us is Trisha Miranda, a literacy and English language arts specialist at the Ohio Department of Education. And from one of our families who submitted a question in advance, um, Melissa wrote, and she, Melissa has a toddler and wants to know the best way to start early literacy at a very young age. Would you like to take that, Rebecca? Oh, yes. I would love to take that. <laughs> yeah. uh, rhyming, uh, singing, in, um, in the bathtub, you can have foam letters and just make it fun through play. Um, I used to, when my, my girls were little, we would play in the tub and build words and, and C-A-T, you know, and, or their names. Um, label around your house. Immerse them in, in, in words so that they can see, oh, this is, this is a table. Uh, or even just the beginning, the T, so that they can see that it, table begins with T. But lots of singing and fun and finger plays and rhyming and just read, read, read to mm -hmm. your child. 
Do you have anything else you want to add about toddlers? No, I, <laughs> and that and preschool is so important, and yes. so and all of those activities come alive in preschool as well. And once again, choosing those rich read alouds or reading aloud to your child, or finding an audio and having them hear stories beginning, middle, and end, asking them questions, asking them to retell, all important. Do you know if um, this, the phonics piece and the sounding out, the tapping that Rebecca was talking about, do, is that being um, taught in preschools? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. Um, we typically start that in kindergarten. Okay. Um, we do expose students, obviously, to everything that we just discussed, print, um, and we want them to understand letters. So we'll, like if I'm teaching the letter A, you know, we're going to make sure that we're using our bodies to help. So if you can get preschoolers to move around, mm. they're going to be one, a lot better at paying attention and two, it just helps connect everything more to them. But no, we're not going to start with tapping and, and explicit phonics instruction in, in kindergarten. So for preschool, I um, mean, for preschool, sorry. Yes. No, we, we know what you're, where you're going. So in preschool, we're starting with like singing the ABCs, knowing the alphabet right? Recognizing all your letters. And then also um, learning the letters in your own name. Is that a good place for Names, parents? Uh, yeah, learning the letters in your own name. Learning the sounds, you can do that as well. Um, it, you just want to make sure that they are just immersed a lot in, in, in all, all things literacy, just reading and singing and playing and, and um, even role play different nursery rhymes and they act them out and that's a really cool thing for the little mm -hmm. the little ones to do. My girls were in preschool and they were in a special needs preschool um, as typical developing students and so it was really neat to have everybody, they had strong peers um, to, to learn from and, and was this, I'm so sorry I lost my train of thought, preschool or were you asking about two-year-olds? Two, I mean, two-year-olds are some, you know, two-year-olds going into preschool. Yeah. Like, okay. the, yeah. The question from the person at home was about toddlers. Toddler. Like, if okay. you're teaching a toddler yes. how to read, yes. right? You're not going to teach a toddler how to read, right. but you're going to teach a toddler to recognize some letters? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could. You mm -hmm. definitely could in their own name, their first letter in their name, mm -hmm. their second. And sometimes um, that's, all, that's all they'll know is the letter, and then you can even talk about the sound, too. <laughs> Birth age to six is really all pre-reading, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and so that's super important. I know at OSU, the Crane Center has that sit together and read program that they work with preschools on, on how to um, look at some books and really bring out the language and the structure of language, and that's been a great program, I know, at, at OSU as well. So you were talking about, you know, making reading fun for preschools, you know, getting them up and, and everything. What about a student who is, you know, somewhere in elementary school right now really struggling with reading. Um, how can you make reading fun? We had a person who submitted a question in advance, um, Tris Neal, and they, they want to know how to make reading fun for their child. It's a good question. We hear it a lot. And so uh, I think when I, a lot of the teachers that I've, I've observed, they, even if they're doing an intensive intervention with that child on a phonics piece, let's say they're in second grade and they need to kind of go back to some K and one skills, um, just that enthusiasm and make, when they know that they can read that sentence that they've had difficulty with over and over again and now they read it to automaticity, it's automatic for them, that's what makes it fun because they can actually read the words and that's what builds that self-confidence piece as well. Uh, do you have any suggestion for parents at home uh, about making reading fun? Because if they're spending all day struggling with reading at school, mm -hmm. maybe the last thing they want to do is come home and have their mom and dad now telling them to sound out all the words. A, a <laughs> lot of what I'll, uh, what I'll do is I, I recommend for uh, move. I'm very much into the movement. Um, mm -hmm. And if I can turn your body into a, a letter, I will do it. <laughs> I was working on the word does with a student the other day and we physically stood up and made the D with our body and the O and the S and the E and said, you know, does, and we cheer them. We we punch out the sounds, uh, anything that engages their bodies, their minds, they will really enjoy that. I think um, I actually was teaching a student about the reading brain and the different parts of the brain. And she, she made me a 3D brain from a 3D printer and she brought it in and we painted the parts of the brain. So actually teaching her about that, she was excited about it. She was able to then 
verbalize what parts of the brain did what, okay. um, and she, she was interactive with that. And the making reading fun, I'm, I can see the getting up and doing all the letters for like a, a younger elementary school age, but what about um, if you have a student who's in fourth or fifth grade and they're just, they're really struggling with the reading, um, do you have any suggestions on making that fun? Encourage, I mean, encouragement <laughs> and positivity and constant feedback. I'm working with a fifth grader right now who we are working on filling in some of those gaps. And she says her favorite part of the day is when she comes to me because we are doing things, oh, I'm meeting her at her where she is and growing her and she loves it because she feels success. So I, I don't know, know if it's actually singing and dancing, you know, that's more for the little ones, but I think feeling that, that intrinsic success feeling for her it makes it fun and she wants to come because she loves she loves learning and so that's yeah. kind of what I, I do Good. so Trisha you're, you're with the Ohio Department of Education how do we get a reading specialist like Rebecca in every single classroom <laughs> in who is so enthusiastic I mean this is what we need right we need a, a reading specialist in every classroom everywhere yeah. well <laughs> what's been great is that uh, with Ohio's learning standards and some of the other literacy initiatives really that what we call tier one core instruction. So the classroom teacher has really built his or her reading um, knowledge base, that capacity um, in the past 10 years, we really have seen that. So they're learning way more about phonics and sound awareness. They're learning about how to work with uh, new English language learners. That's, so I really feel like the classroom teachers have really built their capacity. Um, and, and it's great when uh, schools do have someone like Rebecca, um, but, all, all schools have like a reading specialist mm -hmm. or a Title I teacher or someone that they can go to, but it's really the classroom teacher that's yes. first. Mm. Yes. So um, if you have a child who is still struggling with reading, um, can you talk a little bit about um, how, when, when do you figure out if maybe their problem is something more serious, maybe something like they, they have dyslexia? Uh, when does that become, when does that get identified? Is that something you can know early on if the struggle is, is, is something that needs um, addressed in a different way? So similar to what we said earlier about third grade reading guarantee, um, schools are giving a screener mm -hmm. um, to see kind of that temperature check, see what, what students are, changing up instruction for that student if needed. Um, and then they might give another screener, sometimes it's called an intervention-based diagnostic mm -hmm. to see what the specific areas are that we need to hone in on. Um, and then that repetition, that intensive instruction, we see if that works. You know, we, t we progress monitor, at least get a, like six different um, uh, notations or marks of where they've been in the past six weeks. And from there, the teacher, the principal, and the team of, of teachers really can make a decision on what to do next with that particular child. I'm guessing if someone ha is identified and has dyslexia, the way you teach them how to read is changes? Is there a different method or is it well, still the we're, we're still doing explicit instruction. We're doing that with mm -hmm. our, our tier one. That's our whole mm -hmm. group. Um, and then we have students who have tendencies for dyslexia. We would pull them into a small group, like Trisha said, and we would just do more one-on-one -on -one or small group based of that tier one explicit instruction. It might need a little bit more uh, hands-on, multi-sensory, um, but sometimes in a whole group we'll, we'll lose kids. So if we're using those strategies and we're breaking it down a little bit more specific for that smaller group, you're going to see a lot more growth. And that's what I, 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 and all of our teachers are doing that and that's best practice. Mm -hmm. And is it similar, if, say your child has been identified with like ADHD, mm -hmm. um, is the small group mentality helpful for that too that, or is there a different way for that? Oh, that's helpful too. Mm -hmm. um, but we also try to put in some accommodations. A, a student might need just a list of, like, if they have ADHD, oftentimes I'll have a list um, with bullets of things to help them remember, check off that they need to do. Um, there's There are a lot of things that teachers will do to help keep their children focused. We have. Um, some kids just need to move, mm -hmm. and so we have wobble chairs or mm -hmm. you know bouncy chairs, and and that movement just helps them to be able to focus. So there are a lot of, of things that teachers will do to help their children stay focused and on task and learn. And if there's a parent watching this right now who's just really worried about their child being behind in reading, and they want every day when the child comes home from school they want to like work on it, um, I was reading about how important it is for pa for parents to be patient and purposeful. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about pacing? 
like we're not going to, you know, fix. We're not going to fix a whole year's worth of being behind in reading in in three weeks or something like that. Does that make sense? Do you? Um, what do you think about the the um, the pacing of learning to read? So I think uh, so. Let's say it's that first grade, for example. Mm -hmm. Really important time. That scope and sequence and a student is struggling and they can't get past certain concepts to move on to the next concept and so forth. We, uh, I know what I hear from parents is they really don't like a wait and see model. They want mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. because your early years are super important in building that foundation. So um, we encourage them to talk with the teacher and see what is happening in the classroom, what the teacher is working on in small group or intensifying in those specific areas. And what are some practices that parent could do at home um, if they're able to do so? Do you want to add anything about pacing? I, I just agree with Trisha. That's exactly <laughs> what you need to do. Okay. Yeah. And um, is there, for parents at home, um, uh, my son's a kindergartner, so he has a lot of, um, he has a word wall mm -hmm. of words, sight words that mm -hmm. he needs to know. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I was like, should I be turning those into flashcards? Like what do, do we do flashcards anymore? Can you? Yeah. I, I do use flashcards, mm -hmm. but I do a lot of multi-sensory. I'm very, I, I like to be standing up and like I explained earlier, moving. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and then it depends on the word. If it mm -hmm. has a phoneme or a sound that they, that they know, you know, sometimes I'll underline that so that if they're looking at the word, what the WH, I'll underline it. They know that part and I'll put a little heart over the mm -hmm. AT. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that part, if you're, if you're in communication with the teacher, which is very, very important, um, knowing the scope and sequence and knowing when things are being taught, you're, you're going to be able to move right along at the pace that that child needs. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned word wall. A mm -hmm. lot of kindergarten teachers use sound walls because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sounds are super important. Um, you know, so a C, a K, a CK all make the same sound. So really understanding that. I've seen teachers have, um, their students have little handheld mirrors in kindergarten so that they are pronouncing the sound correctly. Remember in the pandemic, a lot of teachers were making videos on how to teach sounds because they were working through a mask. Mm -hmm. It's really important to see that mouthpiece, the mouth and its movement and what the tongue, you know, touches with the teeth and so forth. So um, I've seen that as well, just just using mirrors with kindergarten. And we have pictures as yes. well of, of the mouth <laughs> beside wow. the different sounds and what your mouth looks like when you're saying eh or eh or ah. And there is actually a picture of <laughs> of a mouth doing that and we'll put that beside the sounds. I mean whenever we talked about the pandemic and where you know students being behind because of it I was thinking more of the time that they were at home or they had to learn on zoom but I didn't really even think about that continuing with wearing a mask in school and not getting to like use your mouth properly I guess right, right? Yeah. Um, so that's important with the way your mouth makes all the letters is it is it a speaking thing and a hearing is it both? Um, I think mostly speaking so that, mm -hmm. well, but they need to be able to hear the sound as well, but they yeah. need to be able to see your mouth. A lot of times I'll have a child, I'll say, look, look at me, or I'll hold a mirror up and I'll do it. And then I'll have them do it so they can actually see where to put the tongue, the teeth, it, all of those things. Um, and we also, when we're teaching explicitly with phonics, we talk about, um, is it a voiced or unvoiced sound? And, and so they're learning, they're becoming more aware of their their mouth and their their t the parts that they use to actually make the sounds. Mm -hmm. That's that's a part of our, our our instruction. Just becoming more aware of it and don't just assume that they know because they don't. <laughs> Most <laughs> of them don't. Okay. Um, so is there? I, I wanted to take just a little bit of time for you know any parents who are watching this or the, um, you know the, the trusted adult of the child at home if they. Um, want to try any specific books, specific apps, if you have anything else to recommend. I think you mentioned a website earlier. Yeah, so uh, there's a fam there's four family guides um, on readingrockets.org, mm -hmm. um, which is just an, it's excellent for teachers, has lots of teacher resources, but it has specific family guides. Um, and talking about some of the activities that Rebecca mentioned as well, um, to do those at home and just real simple um, audio, video and, ex and explanations of that. So that's a really good one as well. Um, for parents of students with dyslexia, um, our understood.org mm -hmm. is also an excellent site for that.
Understood.org. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other resources? Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite book? What's your favorite book to teach kids with? Yeah. It depends on the grade level. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I love all literature. Yeah. Um, all of the, I I just love everything. I don't have a specific title yeah. in mind. Well, uh, what about um, parents reading to kids at night? You know, before bed, mm -hmm. should they be reading books that are at the kid grade level, or is it should we be um, reading above we, both? We want to make sure, obviously, that it's at their grade level, mm -hmm. um, even if they can't read it, decode it themselves, hearing that language, that vocabulary, Magic Tree House, my girls loved that when they mm -hmm. were younger. Um, it, and, and higher level, too, as long as you're there and making, as I spoke earlier, an interactive. So if you come across a word that a, that a child may not know, you want to make sure that you're there to explain it mm -hmm. to them, um, but definitely not below their grade level. Right, right. <laughs> That's why like for preschool, like I'm thinking about my four-year-old nephew just rereading the mm -hmm. same story over and over again. They love that, but they, they gain confidence mm -hmm. in that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we are down to the last couple of minutes. Is there anything you would you want to add out there with, um, you know, if someone's just has a child who's really struggling, but you know how important this, this reading piece is, um, maybe just like a pep talk, some words of advice, anything else you wanted to add? I'd, well, we, both of us are just, uh, just we lo literacy is our love language. We, this is what we do and so forth. But we, we want all students to really have that strong foundation so that they are confident communicators. So whatever they want to do in their life, you know, a reading or a writing hindrance doesn't impede them from taking that hard course or, you know, filling out that tedious application. We just want them to be confident communicators. And that's why in elementary, that foundational piece is super important. Okay. And communicate with your child's parent or your child's teacher. Mm. It's very important. Um, if you have a concern, don't wait. Just ask. Because we're here to, that's, that's our life work, is to help your child grow and learn. So please reach out to your child's teacher. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, you have a room full of 20 some students just it, it, you know, teaching them how to read. I, that's such a, a huge thing. I am I, now I'm like, I have, after having this conversation, I am in awe of kindergarten <laughs> teachers. Um, I'm in awe of reading specialists. I, I, it's just, that's their job. That's their passion, right? Yeah. It is their passion. Yeah. And it is so fun. <laughs> it really is. And to see, I can imagine whenever the kid gets it and the decoding happens and there's like that light that comes mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. I Sometimes I've been so excited. I'll be like, oh my goodness. And they're like, oh, you scared me. <laughs> but I'm so happy you were able to get that word. You did that. You did not give up. Oh, that's a wonderful. That's why as yeah. teachers, like especially in the past few years, reading in the brain, learning about that, building our capacity about reading in the brain, what we've learned from that, we want to definitely use that and transfer that into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as teachers are teaching, but then teachers are still learning themselves. Yes. They're yes. Le yes. Yeah. Teachers are always learning. We're always learning. <laughs> <laughs> that never stops. Right, right. <laughs> well, this has been an Ohio Learns 360 webinar. Thank you for joining us. And I want to say thank you to Trisha Miranda from the Ohio Department of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And also thank you to Rebecca Pitcher, the a literacy supervisor from Dayton. Thank you for being here. And please provide your feedback on tonight's topic and to help inform future topics by completing a survey. The URL is on the screen now, or you can use that QR code. And if you're not able to grab that right now, a link will be emailed in the next 24 hours to anyone who has registered. And if you take the five minutes to do the survey, you'll be entered into a drawing for a chance to win a $100 gift card. We'd like you to join us in March for our next topic, which is caring for children's mental health. Thank you to Ohio Learns 360 and the Ohio Department of Education for this event. Thank you to Amy Palermo for WOSU Classroom for her support and also the television production team at WOSU for making this event possible. You can watch other webinars in this series and find information about upcoming virtual events, including links to register, by visiting our website at ohiolearns360.org. I'm Amy Jurovich. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.